Welcome to this week's episode of Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for this Wednesday, November 7th, 2012. We begin with a story from the world of technology. If you've been following Brainstorm for a while, you know we tend to not cover stories directly about graphene or carbon nanotubes. So when we do cover stories about them, you know it's going to be good. IBM scientists have been developing techniques to construct computer chips based on carbon nanotubes. This is good news because, as we've discussed before, silicon-based information technology is reaching its physical limit. Transistors made from silicon can't get much smaller without becoming unstable, leading to diminishing returns from miniaturization, which necessitates the development of other materials and technologies to continue the improvement of information technology. Earlier this year, the IBM scientists demonstrated that the nanotubes could effectively perform as transistors, at about half the size of the latest silicon ones. However, despite them having great potential, there are some challenges related to carbon-based computers. Mainly, the purification to ensure no metallic compounds are present, and the precise placement of the carbon nanotubes. Overcoming these obstacles is what the IBM group has been working on, and they are making significant progress. They've developed a new method that allows them precision placement on a standard computer chip substrate. Basically, the carbon nanotubes are made water-soluble with a surfactant, also known as a soap. The substrate is mainly silicon oxide with tiny channels of chemically modified hafnium oxide. This gets dipped into the carbon solution and the nanotubes chemically bond to the hafnium oxide, creating the circuit. Using this technique, the IBM team created a 10,000 transistor microchip, the most advanced from carbon nanotubes yet. Work will continue refining and testing this new kind of microchip it'll hopefully lead to even more powerful computer technology. Next is an update from the field of chemistry. We've discussed before that a lot of research is going into the development of organic-based plastics and other useful materials. This is necessary, as much of our synthetic materials are based on petrochemicals. One option is turning to the hydrocarbons found in biology, like sugars. However, as with biofuels, how we source those sugars is important to making production sustainable. So scientists in Germany have started up a pilot plant for the chemical processing of waste wood. As you may know, wood has two main structural components, the complex sugar cellulose and the protein lignin. Right now, our main purpose for processing cellulose is the production of pulp for paper products, but still half of that material gets burned. Both cellulose and lignin could be better used, which is what this pilot plant intends to do. They process the wood by boiling it at high temperatures and pressures in water and alcohol, allowing the lignin to be extracted and from there the protein can be processed into a binding agent or other useful material. The cellulose remains solid after this process, after which it could be broken into simple sugars for a variety of uses. Although the more theoretical work on sustainable materials is encouraging, it's nice to see scientists begin applying their laboratory findings to a production setting. Development will continue, though, working on making the process as energy and resource efficient as possible, hopefully continuing to scale up production of biomaterials. Our final story comes from the world of neuroscience. A team from Harvard Medical School have made some surprising discoveries related to Parkinson's and other neurological conditions. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter related to many processes, including learning and movement coordination. The main cause of Parkinson's symptoms is the death of dopamine-producing neurons in a brain region called the statum. Many treatments attempt to correct this by supplying precursors for dopamine, allowing for more rapid production. However, these treatments often have only a temporary effect, and this team likely discovered why. They were studying mice dopamine neurons in a dish to see how they affected surrounding neurons. Using optogenetics, the dopamine neurons were activated with light. They observed the unusual inhibition of surrounding neurons. Turns out, dopamine neurons were also producing substantial amounts of another neurotransmitter called GABA, which we actually discussed a few weeks ago being a key inhibitor keeping balance in the brain. This was so surprising, they did a whole other set of experiments to confirm it was GABA, first by blocking a protein known to transport it. Now this is a pretty significant discovery, because with further study, it would essentially make us reevaluate current models of Parkinson's and other conditions. 
Hopefully, the role of this second neurotransmitter will lead to better, more long-term treatments. It may also cause scientists to re-examine other conditions thought to be mainly based on one transmitter, like serotonin with depression. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.